matcha flavored Kit Kats, wasabi flavored Kit Kats, soy sauce flavored Kit Kats? Perhaps you've heard that there are over 350 different flavors of Kit Kat in Japan, but why? Why are there so many flavors? Why are they so popular? And what are Kit Kats? This is everything you didn't know about Kit Kats and maybe a few things you did. Hi, my name is Philip, and for the last several months I have been researching Kit Kats as part of my PhD in Kit Kat studies. Just kidding, Kit Kat studies is not a real thing. Unless it is. The Kit Kat story begins in 1862 with a gentleman by the name of Henry Isaac Roundtree. He founded a company named Roundtree in Castlegate, York. Now this company started off very small. By 1869, they only had 12 employees, but over the next 120 years, they would become the fourth largest candy manufacturer in the entire world. Initially, Roundtree was known for their fruit pastilles, which were a gummy candy that was fruit flavored and covered in sugar. Later, they would become known for inventing Kit Kats as well as Smarties, the chocolate British Smarty candy, whatever. But at this point in time, early on, they had yet to uh, break into the chocolate industry. That was an industry that was dominated by a small little company called Cadbury. Several things happened in the 1800s which would change the confectionery industry forever. And the first of those things was the invention of a cocoa press by Van Houten. In 1828, Van Houten patented a hydraulic press that would push most of the fat out of the cocoa bean, leaving behind a less fatty cake that could easily be pulverized into cocoa powder. And cocoa powder is the basis for everything chocolate. His patent lasted for 10 years, and after those 10 years were up, every other candy manufacturer that wanted to make chocolate could now use this technology. Other major changes of the 1800s was population growth and an increase in wages. The population of Great Britain between 1800 and 1900 tripled. And as the towns and the cities grew, there were a lot more people. And as they made more money, and the cost of food went down, they now had money to spend on things that weren't always necessities, and that made a mass market that was ready for the confectionery world. No one knows for certain why Roundtree trademarked the name Kit Kat, but in 1911, they did. Now there's a lot of speculation. It's possible that this referred to Christopher Catling, who was a pastry chef or it could refer to the Kit Kat Club, which was a group of Whigs who liked to meet in Catling's Tavern and discuss politics, literature, and also eat mutton pies, which were also apparently called Kit Kats. There's a handful of other theories about why Kit Kat was a popular term, and it might have been the ceilings, it could have been some artwork, but quite honestly, we don't know. And even the historians and the archivists who know the entire history don't really know why it was trademarked. What we do know is it took Roundtree over 20 years to actually use the name for one of their products. In the early 1900s, Roundtree was in a tight spot. They were ahead of the game in marketing, but they were struggling product-wise. By 1922, Cadbury was producing 20 times more chocolate than Roundtree, and Roundtree couldn't keep up with the competitive pricing. As Fitzgerald says in his book, Roundtree and the Marketing Revolution, despite being soundly and economically managed, Roundtree was constantly unable to make even the minimum profit compatible with the well-being of the business. Urban legend is that Kit Kat came about as the result of a worker putting a suggestion into a recommendation box at Roundtree, and their suggestion was that Roundtree should make something that a man could take to work in his pack. It's unclear to me why other snacks couldn't be put in a man's pack and taken to work. I am also unclear on the timing of this suggestion because around this time, Roundtree was already looking to create a high quality product that they could manufacture cheaply. It's worth noting here that Roundtree took a lot of pride in their products. They saw themselves as a high-end confectionery producer. And even as they were creating a marketing department, they had a little bit of pushback from the Roundtree family. Joseph Roundtree thought that poster advertising was just not respectable. In the late 1800s, 
Advertising was wordy. You would explain to somebody why they buy your product. In 1919, posters and newspaper ads were becoming popular. And the board of directors, they were afraid they were appealing to the modern cinema going type of mind rather than the dispassionate, more literary consumer. Wow. So in some ways, Kit Kats were a gamble. Could Roundtree produce this cheap candy and still maintain the prestige they thought they had of being a higher end confectionery company? The good news is that it only took a small initial investment for them to begin making this wafer crisp. And in 1935, the board of directors finally gave the green light. The process for making Kit Kats has been very well documented by several sources. Cheddar Gadgets has a really good video on the process and how it's made. And even Nestle Japan has a series of videos on inside their factory and the process of making a Kit Kat. In a nutshell though, the most important part of the Kit Kat is the wafer. And that is a recipe that is a highly guarded industry secret. The wafers are cooked and cooled, and then they are coated with a mixture of chocolate pressed together and cut into small pieces. The pieces are then put inside a mold that already has chocolate on it. They are covered with chocolate. The excess chocolate is scraped off. They are cooled, they are packaged, and they are shipped out. And that's basically how Kit Kats are made. Now, I've seen it reported that the filling of Kit Kats is actually made of discarded Kit Kats, and that's only partially true. Most of the filling is just a mixture of chocolate. It's less catchy, although probably more accurate to say that discarded Kit Kats can be reincorporated into the chocolate mixture that is used to coat the wafer crisps. It's really just a way for them to cut down on waste products. In fact, in at least one Japanese factory, if there is a wafer that is cracked, damaged, or otherwise defective, they recycle that wafer as animal feed at nearby farms. I would love to be one of those animals. Each bar of a Kit Kat is called a finger, and the number of fingers in each bar varies. Four is the normal number of bars, but there are two-fingered bars, and in other countries, there are as many as 12-fingered bars. I only have 10 fingers. You're gonna have to imagine 12. The size of the fingers also varies a little bit. This is a two-finger Kit Kat, and this is a four-finger Kit Kat. So those aren't the same size, and the specialty Japan flavors are even smaller. Round Tree's Chocolate Crisps were launched in September of 1935. They were not initially advertised, yet they were a hit, and they were a big hit. Initially, Round Tree estimated their profits for 1935 to be 80,000 pounds sterling, but they released two products in 1935. One was an Aero chocolate bar, which was an aerated chocolate. The other one was Kit Kat. They launched them at the same time. And after seeing how well these two products did, they revised their estimate on their profits for the year from 80,000 pounds sterling to 200,000 pounds sterling. In today's currency, that's going from $7.1 million to $17.8 million. That's a big jump. In 1936, the British chocolate market was estimated to be around 700 tons per week, and the Roundtree Chocolate Crisp was being produced at 80, and it still was not being advertised. As the Chocolate Crisp grew in popularity, leadership at Roundtree was concerned that perhaps the name was too generic. Other companies might be able to take it or make a competing product and call it a very similar thing. Yet the term, chocolate crisp was also familiar to customers at this point and they didn't want to get rid of it completely. And that's why they made the decision to change the name to Kit Kat Chocolate Crisp. When they finally started advertising the chocolate crisp, the first advertisements were targeted at the snack market. They used taglines like the little biggest meal and the best companion to a cup of tea. The ads contained action pictures with happy people of all ages enjoying Kit Kats. With the name changed to Kit Kat, the company also started to use the word break as part of their advertising. Give yourself a break at tea time. That's a slogan from 1939. Sadly, just when Kit Kats were starting to take off, World War II hit. World War II caused a lot of trouble for Roundtree. Milk, butter, sugar, oil, and other food supplies were being rationed by the government, and the food ministry said that confectionery companies 
had to obey the rationing rules. This meant there just weren't ingredients to create things like Kit Kats. Some confectionery companies started to get rid of fancy packaging during this time. They felt that if they could make their packaging look very utilitarian, maybe they could slip in under the radar as an essential food and not as a luxury. Ultimately, Roundtree decided to change the Kit Kat formula so they could still keep making Kit Kats during the war. They dropped the term chocolate crisp from the candy name and they changed the packaging from red to blue. The company feared that they would lose the goodwill of customers because of these changes, and so each wrapper contained some explanation text. Because no milk can be obtained for chocolate manufacture, the chocolate crisp you knew in peacetime can no longer be made. Kit Kat is the nearest possible product at the present time. The board felt that if they lost any goodwill with this change over the war, they could revert the title of the candy back to Chocolate Crisp after the war and then regarner any support that they had lost. Yet, for all their efforts, Roundtree was finally forced to stop making Kit Kats in 1945. The war had taken its toll on the confectionery industry. And that is why there are no Kit Kats today. Just kidding. Roundtree was very eager to start marketing Kit Kats again following VE and VJ Day in 1945, but supplies were still being rationed and they were difficult to come by. The biggest supply issue was actually milk. They needed that to make the milk chocolate. They tried to reintroduce the milk chocolate Kit Kat, but in April of 1946, they once again had to revert back to the wartime variety of Kit Kats because the supplies just didn't exist. In fact, food rationing would remain in place for another six years. It wasn't until 1954 when the shortages were officially considered over and Roundtree was able to produce enough Kit Kats to meet the demand. But the war had other long-term consequences. The Ministry of Food put more policies in place, dictating the claims you could make in your advertisements, the images you can use on your packaging, and requiring synthetic material to be listed on the ingredient list. This meant companies couldn't make unverified health claims in their advertisements. They couldn't put pictures of fruit on their packaging unless fruit was a major ingredient. Roundtree was considering putting a substitute fat called lithicin in their Kit Kats. If they increased the formula from 0.4% to 1%, the Kit Kat would taste exactly the same and they would save the company something like 100,000 pounds per year but they would have to note this on the ingredient list. How would the consumers react? I honestly don't know how it turned out. Still, Kit Kats continued to grow in popularity. After the war, they started using slogans like, have a break, have a Kit Kat. Peter Roundtree was skeptical of using the word break in the advertisements, but the board really liked the idea. Break both described the product, but also associated their product with rest and leisure. By the 1970s, Roundtree was selling Kit Kats in countries around the world, but they were still unable to break into the US market. They actually did some product testing in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and they ran TV ads in Toronto as they continued to gauge the feasibility of being in America. But as much as they wanted to produce Kit Kats in the US, they ultimately kind of gave up. They ended up selling the trademark to Hershey. So Hershey now owned the rights to produce and distribute Kit Kats in the US, provided that Hershey was not sold. If Hershey was sold, the rights would return to Roundtree. Roundtree made a similar deal with a Japanese candy company called Fujia, and Fujia would continue to produce and sell Kit Kats in Japan until Nestle bought Roundtree in 1988. Now, Nestle is a Swiss company that was officially founded in 1905 when two other Swiss companies that were both founded in 1866 merged together. Today, Nestle is the largest food company in the entire world. Worldwide, they have nearly 450 factories and they employ something like 339,000 people. That is more than the entire population of Santa Ana, California. When Nestle purchased Roundtree, they took over the Kit Kat production in Japan, but they continued to honor the agreement with Hershey. And that's why Hershey is still making Kit Kats to this day. And is also a reason that Hershey was not sold in 2002. 
But here I am rambling on about history and you just want to know about the flavors. Let's talk flavors. The first Kit Kat flavor after the war came in 1996 when Nestle decided to make Kit Kat orange for the UK. This was a huge hit and it prompted them to make a dark chocolate and mint variant of the Kit Kat as well. As I'm recording this in the fall of 2020, Kit Kats in the United States can be purchased in milk chocolate, dark chocolate, white chocolate, mint and dark chocolate, birthday cake, and apple pie flavoring. This year, they also released raspberry cream for Valentine's Day, lemon crisp for Easter, pumpkin pie for fall, and let's not forget witch's brew for Halloween. But all of these flavors pale in comparison to the 400 plus flavors that have been released in Japan. As I'm recording this, it is very likely that over 400 flavors of Kit Kat have been released, yet there is no official list of flavors. The longest list of flavors I could find contained only 220 different flavors. And during the course of my research, the website listing these went offline. It can now only be accessed via the Wayback Machine. Personally, I'm hoping that I can compile a more complete list of all the different Kit Kat flavors. However, I don't know if I can do it alone. If you run across any new or exciting Kit Kat flavors, be sure to comment down below and let me know where I can find them. Or visit bluecoffeepanda.com slash form and fill out the form to tell me more about the Kit Kat you found. Kit Kats were first sold in Japan in 1973, and for the first 27 years, they were relatively unremarkable. Not much history is noted until the year 2000, and since the year 2000 has been when all the flavors have come about. The first flavor introduced in Japan was strawberry. To make this flavor, they mixed a finely ground powder of dehydrated strawberry juice with the chocolate, and they made a very strategic choice to release this new Kit Kat in Hokkaido, the northernmost island in Japan, and they would release it at the beginning of strawberry season. It was a huge hit, both with the locals and with the Japanese tourists who were headed north for strawberry season. In fact, it was such a big success that they decided they could exploit this even further. They started to wonder, could they make a special flavor for each region or province or city or season? Could they make a special location specific flavor? They wanted to make souvenir Kit Kats. Souvenirs are really big in Japan. It's a cultural expectation that you will buy little gifts for your family, friends, and even coworkers when you are going on a trip. It's called omiyage, and I'm told it's difficult to translate into English because it means more than just a souvenir. Typically, it's something that is locally produced or something a region is really well known for. And it's also something that looks nice. It has elegant packaging. While visiting Tokyo, I stumbled across an omiyage store quite by accident, and I was able to pick up eight different flavors of Kit Kat there. The Kit Kats came in these fun little cardboard boxes. They each contained 12 Kit Kats, and the boxes looked really nice. They said things on the side like Tokyo Souvenir, and they were definitely the sort of thing you could present as a gift to somebody after your travels. Spurred on by the success of the strawberry Kit Kats, they decided to produce orange, pineapple, and banana flavored Kit Kats as well. In 2003, Nestle hired a Japanese pastry chef named Yasumasa Takagi to help create new flavors of Kit Kat. His first flavor was passion fruit, and they launched it in 2005. Today, it typically takes around six months to develop and test a new Kit Kat flavor. Most of the flavors introduced are limited edition flavors, and they're only available for a season or two. Now there are something like 40 flavors which are available year round and all the time, but there's also another 20 or 30 flavors that come and go every year. Nestle has even created some very high end Kit Kats that are special and expensive. There's a series called Sublime Kit Kats and even a volcanic Kit Kat series. They describe the volcanic series this way. The flavors were discovered on the volcanic islands of Papua New Guinea Venutu and the Philippines. Takagi describes the Kit Kats as having the taste of earth and saying that each flavor represents a different volcanic island. 
These Kit Kats come in a single long finger and cost as much as eight US dollars per bar. The two flavors I have tried have been phenomenal, but they are not something I'm going to buy on a regular basis. Perhaps you've heard that Kit Kats are well named for the Japanese market, and that is very true. In Japan, Kit Kats are called Kitu Kato, and that sounds very similar to a Japanese phrase that is Kitu Katsu. And Kitu Katsu translates to surely win, which could be I will surely win or you will surely win, depending on context. In the early 2000s, Nestle noticed that every January there was a huge spike in sales and this coincided with Japanese exam season, the time of year when all the Japanese high school students would be taking exams. They realized people were buying these for students as a good luck gift or a good luck charm and they decided that this was a marketing opportunity. Nestle partnered with the Japan Post Service and the Post Service had been privatized in 2007, otherwise this wouldn't have worked. But in 2009, Nestle decided to make a special Kit Kat that could be mailed like a postcard and they sold them at post offices. This means basically overnight, Kit Kat was available in 20,000 new locations that did not have any competing products. This marketing move was so brilliant, it won them first place at the Media Grand Prix for the 56th Canes Lions International Advertising Festival in 2009. And over the next eight years, the sales of Kit Kat in Japan would increase by 50%. Even today, some of the Kit Kats have space on the back for people to write notes. These are two of the most cited reasons why Kit Kats are so popular in Japan, but they don't fully explain why there are so many different flavors. So I had to dig a little bit deeper. I found an NPR morning show from 2010 that helped to explain the Japanese phenomena of all the different crazy flavors. In this show, Lynn Neary interviews a Tokyo journalist named Lucy Kraft and a marketing expert called David Marks. Are those like made up names? That is fantastic. <laughs> Today, there are over 50,000 convenience stores in Japan and many of them are right across the street from each other. So competition is very tight. The shops are also very tiny. Products are constantly competing with each other for shelf space, and if a product doesn't sell right away, it doesn't get picked up again. Shops don't have space for things that are just going to sit on the shelves for a long period of time. Shop owners are constantly looking for something that is new and exciting and that will fly off the shelves very quickly. This is why so many flavors are limited edition flavors. Flavors like soy sauce are unlikely to have a lasting market, and so shops are unlikely to want them after the initial craze. That means many of these flavors are just flash in the pan flavors. They're made for short term sales. Make something crazy, hope the convenience stores like it and pick up on it, and then move on to the next thing. This also means there's gonna be a lot of flavors of Kit Kat I'm never gonna be able to try. So that is Kit Kat. Where they came from, who makes them, and why there are so many different flavors in Japan. If you like this video and enjoyed learning about Kit Kats and would love to learn more about the flavors behind the Kit Kats, uh, be sure to like and subscribe and do all of the things that I'm supposed to tell you to do when the video ends. You can find a transcript of this video along with links to all of my sources at bluecoffeepanda.com. Until next time, 